Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our 5 Minute Histories videos. And today I'm on Liberty Heights uh, Avenue in the Gwyn Oak Junction area, if you know where that, where that is in Northwest Baltimore. And we're going to talk about the theater behind me, the Ambassador Theater. It is not 8 o'clock in the morning and it is already hot as blue blazes, so we are going to jump right in and get going. When this theater opened in 1935, it was the crown jewel uh, for the architect, John Zink, and for the owner, uh, Frank Durkee. And that's no small feat. Um, Zink has designed over 100 theaters in the Maryland and sort of mid-Atlantic area. Um, and Durkee was Baltimore's largest uh, movie house uh, owner with over two dozen. So being the crown jewel really meant something. But we're going to start our story not with them, but with why they wanted to build a theater here in the first place in the Howard Park neighborhood. And that uh, means we're going to start in 1894. That's when two gentlemen, Nicholas Smith and William Schwartz, bought up four ac 400 acres in Baltimore County, clearly hoping that the city would uh, develop out to them and they could sell off lots as real estate uh, uh, folks. Um, they were impatient and they did two things to speed the process along. One was they built a streetcar stop here um, for the Walbrook, Gwyn Oak, and Powhatan Railway, obviously hoping that that would be an attraction, and they developed Gwyn Oak Park. As an aside, I know we've covered Gwyn Oak Park in at least one other video as the site of a, of a sustained and ultimately successful civil rights uh, effort to desegregate the park. So, uh, so our, our real estate folks, uh, Smith and Schwartz, um, have to wait a little while though. Real estate uh, development does not take off. It really isn't until 1918 that things get going. That's when Baltimore City annexes this part of Baltimore County and provides water and sewer and gas lines and electricity and paved roads. People really like the paved roads and they start uh, flocking out to places like Ashburton and Liberty Heights and Howard Park. Um, all of these begin to fill up with people, which makes this spot, the commercial hub of the area, ideal for a theater. But D Durkee's got just one problem. There already is a theater here. His competitor, the Rome Company, uh, built a theater in 1933. Undaunted, uh, Durkee decides to buy the lot across the street from Rome's theater um, and uh, starts going after building permits. The Rome folks, of course, are not too happy. They fight in the permit office, they fight in city hall, they fight in city council, they fight in the courts. But after two years, Durkee prevails and gets to build this theater, the ambassador that we have today. Um, ironically, just a few months after uh, the theater opens, uh, Rome and Durkee merge, so the whole fight was really for nothing to begin with. Um, so uh, when the theater opens, uh, theater historian Robert Headley says this is Baltimore's first modern theater. It's got sight lines that are the very most uh, modern in design. It's got acoustics. Um, it's got projection systems that are all uh, the best that you can get. It's even got a nursery, so if your kid can't make it through the movie, you've got a place to put her or him uh, to, so you can enjoy the rest of the show. And it seats a 1,000 people. Imagine uh, in our day of watching everything in our living rooms, uh, imagine a theater with a 1,000 people. I hope we get to do that again. Um, so who was this gentleman, Z John Zink, who was the, the designer of this theater, um, this art, wonderful Art Deco movie palace, maybe? Um, he got his start at MICA, the Maryland Institute College of Art, and then and worked for a firm, an architecture firm here, Wyatt and Nolting. If you know the 5th Regiment Armory or the Mitchell Courthouse downtown, that's their work. And if you've ever been to Bel Air and gone to Liriodendron, the wonderful summer house of Howard Kelly, one of the founding doctors of Hopkins Hospital, um, that's their work as well. But Zink wanted to be a theater designer, so he moves to New York and he works under a gentleman, Thomas Lamb. And I know you also know Thomas Lamb's work, um, the Fox Theater in San Francisco. Lamb was really maybe the premier theater designer in the country. The Keith Theater in Boston, the Boston Opera House, um, Madison Square Garden, and then very close to home, our own Hippodrome Theater on the west side of downtown. But Zink breaks away and uh, does his own business and becomes really uh, the preeminent theater designer designer in uh, the mid-Atlantic, again with over 100 theaters to his credit. When this opens up, he's pretty pleased with it, uh, but his client, Durkee, is even more pleased. With a little bit of flair for the theatric, on opening day, Durkee declares, quote, this theater is the realization of an ideal, a crowning achievement, for no city in the world has a more modern, more luxurious, more perfectly conceived theater. 
Well, how about that? Um, apparently the crowds agree. They flock here. Um, and they've continued to flock here through the 1940s um, and World War II, uh, both to see shows and to get news on how the war is going. The 1950s are not so good for theaters across the country. Um, if you're my age, you remember when music television, MTV, started, and its first music video was, I think it was, Video Killed the Radio Star. Well, something similar happened in the 1950s, only it was television killed uh, the movie house star as a four Portable TVs popped up into people's living rooms, fewer and fewer people went out to buy tickets to the local movie house. Uh, the ambassador makes it through this the 1950s crunch by being able to run uh, show first run uh, movies. I guess then as now, people still flock to see the latest and greatest movies. But by 1968, the theater can't make it and it has to close. Um, the building becomes uh, at various times a roller rink, a dance hall. The dance hall use the, the neighborhood of Howard Park doesn't like. They call it a danger to the community. I don't know what they were doing in there or out here. Um, uh, becomes a church. Church, uh, but then becomes vacant for many, many years. But we're going to wrap up on a, a positive note. In uh, 2016, the city, through its receivership process, um, gets the building and puts half a million dollars into stabilizing it. And today, a nonprofit organization out of Minneapolis called uh, Art Space um, owns the building. They began the planning for restoring it and turning it into an arts and community center uh, before COVID. COVID slowed them down a little bit, but not totally. Um, They've now engaged a local architecture firm, Quinn Evans, that has loads of theater experience, historic theater experience, um, to do the design. They're working with neighborhood organizations and uh, local folks here in the surrounding communities. Um, and I am hopeful that in the not too distant future, I'll be able to come back and we will uh, have a brand new marquee uh, with uh, maybe what Durkee would call uh, the most luxurious and perfectly conceived rehabbed historic theater in the world. All right, thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.